Yes. Receive the anointing that the Spirit of the Lord is pouring into this house. Receive the anointing that the Spirit of God is pouring in this city and upon this nation. The anointing of the Lord is very tangible. It's a tangible anointing because God is a supernatural God. He is a supernatural God. He's a God of the supernatural. And as we move out in the realm of the supernatural and allow the Lord to, to be in us who he wants to be, to do with us that which he desired to do, then we too as a people, we too as a city, as a nation, as a house, we will walk in the supernatural. We will experience the move of God as it has not been experienced before. And this is the time that the Lord is calling upon us. There's a demand in the realm of the spirit. There's a demand that the Spirit of God is pressing into us at this time. And, and be aware that as, as the Lord comes, he's going to, he's, hmm, some, the Lord is going to begin to press that button. He's going to begin to press that button. And you must respond to the Spirit of God. Many of us desire and we want to see the things of God. But there is a price to be paid. There is a price. Yes, we understand that Jesus has paid the price. But there is a price to be paid for the anointing. There is a price to be paid for the anointing. And the demonstration of the word requires the anointing. The word said, for this cause, the Son of God was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. In, in Acts 10, 38, the word tells us how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good, healing all that was oppressed of the devil, because God was with him. God was with him. And it's that same God, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. He is the anointed one in the midst of us. And the Lord is calling us as his anointed vessel, as his flames of fire in the earth, that we may set the earth on fire. For Jesus said in his word, he said, how I desire that when I come, that there is fire in the hearts of men. He's desiring to find us on fire, to set us ourselves ablaze with the word and with the purpose of God. Because when we are ablaze with the word of God, when we're ablaze with the purpose of God, then we can ignite the city. The city needs to be ignited with the word of God. The nation needs to be ignited with the word of God. And that's what he's saying unto us. He wants to set us ablaze. He wants us to burn with a passion, burn with a desire for his kingdom until we see the kingdom of God manifested in the earth, until we see the kingdom of God manifested in our lives as earthen vessels in the hand of God. That's his desire. That's his desire. Hallelujah. Well, this morning as we go into reproducing the Father's agreement, branded with his covenant, I want us to look into scripture in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, verse 1 and as we do that um, I want to share, share something concerning uh, these areas of uh, agreement and covenant um, in the Webster dictionary agreement stands for 
contract or promise. And covenant stands for uh, also promise, treaty, pledge, pact, and agreement. So it's synonymous. It's synonymous that uh, these two words run together and there is an agreement between them. But as we look into the word this morning in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 says, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Yes. And whoever curse you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. And the word continues, so Abraham left at the Lord had told him, and he went, and Lot with him, went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old. So there, within the context of the, the scripture, shows that there was an agreement, and there was a covenant. Both of them working together at that very present time. And Abraham trusted God for what he said to him. Abraham was a man of faith. I want to show you something here. You see, you cannot have, one cannot have covenant without an agreement. But one can, can have an agreement without covenant. Abraham stepped into the arena with God and became God's agent, or should I say God's son, to f perform his will in the earth. And because of this, we see even in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, Abraham stepped out not knowing where he was going. Abraham decided, if Elohim spoke to me, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to be obedient to the voice of God. And out of this, we see where Abraham made covenant with God. Yeah. I'm stepping a little bit ahead of myself in the message, but I want to show you something. We have to come to a place where we know the voice of the Lord. We have to get to a place where we have gotten to have fellowship with God, where we can hear His voice and understand that He is speaking to us. Yeah. And because of this, we are standing today by faith. We are standing as sons in the earth by faith because of Abraham's obedience and Abraham's covenant that he made with God. 
or should I say God made covenant with Abraham. You see, as I said, you can have an agreement without covenant. There are many corporations that are having written agreements and there is no covenant. Men are signing documents and saying, okay, we agree to this, we agree to that, but further down, they, they stop each other from fulfilling what the corporation is supposed to do. Because what? They did not come into covenant relationship. This is where God wants us to come into relationship with him true covenant. We need to be branded in our hearts with the word of God. Or should I say, we need to have faith to believe God for what God's word says. Yes. We need not to back away from his word, for his word is forever established. And if we allow the spirit of the Lord to do what needs to be done with us, then we can see the true essence of what we are called to do in the earth. Yes. As I said in Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews 11 chapter 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see, I went looking for the meaning of substance. And this is what Mr. Webster have written concerning substance. He says, any material that possesses physical properties is called a substance. So we can look and say, okay, Physical properties, water, that's a substance. It's made up of two compounds, H2O, hydrogen, two parts, and oxygen, one part. Combine them and you have agua. So if you're drinking water, you're drinking what? Substance. Substance. <coughs> now, when we look into the scripture also, Noah, Abraham, and Moses were men of faith. They believed God in the agreement that God proposed to each of them. See, God dialogued with these men and brought them to the place where each one made an agreement with God. And through this, they got branded in their hearts with God's covenant purposes. When Noah heard from God, God says, Noah, go and build the, the ark. Noah did what? Obeyed. Obeyed. And through his obedience, eight individuals were saved. Now we're at an encounter with God, and God brought back Noah and his family back into covenant relationship. Yes. And through this, that's where we now stand today, because if it wasn't for Noah's obedience to God's covenant, then we would all be lost. 
I'm bringing some narratives to you this morning. I'm not going to be doing a lot of demonstration or shouting or stuff like that. This, I believe there's some things that the Spirit of the Lord wants us to, 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 to um, develop and to bring forth out of this. Abraham, likewise, came into covenant relationship with God. God told him to go. And he went not knowing where he was going. But Abraham had to go through certain things to get to the place where God stepped in and made covenant with him. God cut covenant with Abraham. God made covenant with Abraham and told Abraham, if you do this, then this will happen to you. I will make of you a great nation. You see, in the loins of, of Abraham were the nations of the earth. In the loins of Abraham were you and I. Sons of God. See, sons of God needs to rise up in this time and take their rightful place on the earth. So that God's kingdom can be established in the four corners of the earth. See, we are looking in days, at, in, in these times where churches are closing. When churches should be established. There, 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 there are evil men that are in places that need to be removed. And righteous men need to rise up in the land. The narrative that I'm bringing to you is that Abraham was a righteous man. And God rose, uh, raised him up to a place where he was sent into Egypt. And plundered Egypt. And brought out the spoils to fulfill God's purpose. What am I saying is that God's kingdom needs men and women who will go in and plunder the kingdom of darkness. And bring out the spoils and make God's kingdom be established in the earth. I believe God is going to do some supernatural things with us in the season. Legacy life. Church of the living God. Yes. I believe that the Lord is about to transform us from who we are into who he wants us to be. Yes. The man Abraham. He came out of Ur of the Chaldees. He did not have a lot of substance. But when he left Egypt. He left Egypt with a lot of substance. Yes. Substance. God wants us to be fully furnished in all areas of our lives. As sons, we need to be walking around as kings and priests unto God. We need not to be walking around as paupers. See, the church of the living God has lived into a pauper mentality through the years. But the Lord is going to do a work in us to bring us into real sonship upon this land. And I'm going to make a statement right now that's going to profound a lot of you. And I don't... I'm not one for political arenas, but I'm telling you something. God has risen up Trump for a reason. Yes. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Many of you might not agree, but that's what God wants to do. The man stood up and he says, God, 
That's the only thing I want to hear from a man's heart. What does that have to do with sonship? It means that the Lord is working in his life. The Lord is doing an incision, has done an incision in his heart. And is bringing forth his will through him and he's going to do it. You might not agree, but it's going to be done. Yes. Right. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Now, when we look back in the years where Abraham was sent into Egypt, that's what God did. God raised up Abraham to the point where Abraham was so rich, he was able to establish God's purpose in the earth. If it wasn't for Abraham... Joseph couldn't be brought into the king's palace and to do for um, the purpose of God. Because out of those loins came Joseph. Out of those loins came you and I. You, some of you <laughs> sitting back there say, okay, you're a black man, yeah? So what that has that have to do with God's kingdom? I'm part of his kingdom. Whether you like it or not, the Lord is doing a work with us. And so, even this today as I stand here before you to declare the truth of God, I want you to see that sons support the will of the Father. Yes. Jesus declared, not my will, but thy will be done. Yes. When Jesus said that, he was saying to his Father, Father, your will will be done when I go to the cross. Yes, Lord. He had to pay the price. To redeem us. Because if he didn't redeem us, we would all be lost. Amen. The word of God says in Hebrews 10, um, 35 to 36 says, Cast not away therefore your confidence which have great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So the promise is, is agreement. The promise is, is covenant. Mm -hmm. And if we look back through the scriptures, or as we look back through the natural uh, bloodline that is there, there is so much that the Lord has imparted to the body of Christ. There's so much that is given to us, but we do not recognize it. God wants us to, to, to realize that he, he wants us to come into oneness with Him. Because when we come into oneness with Him, then we will be confident enough to be able to go into the nations of the earth and to establish the will of God. We will not be afraid now, uh, let, me, let me say this to you. My narrative is a little bit rough today, but if you go into nations that do not have understanding of Christ, they will try to put you down. But if you're going in there through God's Grace, God's anointing. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say to you this morning that we have this treasure which is in our earthen vessels. 
We need to demonstrate. And I don't mean like what those, I would, those people were doing yesterday, demonstrating. Demonstration, demonstration, demonstrate the power of God. Demonstrate the anointing of God. Demonstrate the word of God. Demonstrate in such a way that people are shaken in their boots. See, when you're going to a supermarket, I've seen this. When you're going to a supermarket, the climate change because of what? The anointing that is upon your life. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it so many times. When you walk into a place, immediately you see the change. The change that comes from, from, from your stepping into that place. All because you have stepped into sonship. Hallelujah. The word declare unto us. See, when we speak of covenant, it is so important that we understand that from Genesis through Revelation, there is a thread. There is a thread that runs throughout the scripture. And that blood continues to flow throughout the scripture. And, and we cannot have covenant outside of the blood of Jesus. This is why men break agreements every day. This is why men write what is known as a contract. And then within that contract, there are clauses that will allow them to turn around and break that contract at any given time without cause. But when we look at the word of God, we have a more certain promise. We have an oath. We have a pledge that is from God the Father. And that, that word is running throughout the scripture. Every book of the Bible that we look in, we can find the covenant entwined within that book. We can find ourselves as sons of God entwined in the word of God throughout the scriptures. And so as we proceed in the scriptures and as we proceed with the word of God, it gives us an understanding where we can begin to have a, a, a better knowledge or better understanding of the agreement or of, of who we are in Christ and that which he has called us to do as sons of God. Because the word tells us in, in 1 John, in the, third, in the third book of John, it said, Beloved, what manner or what kind of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. What love? What love has the Father placed upon us that we should be called sons of God? And because we are called the sons of God, the world does not even know us. Because the world does not know God. And then it continues. It says, beloved, now, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We are the sons of God. We are the manifested sons of God. And Prophet sp spoke earlier with regarding the, the covenant, uh, what the word covenant means. And, and the symbolism of covenant as we walk through that in the earth. It is such a solemn 
solemn agreement that God has set in the earth for us as a people to walk in. It is unlike, the covenant is unlike anything that man can produce in the earth. If men make a covenant with another person, it has, in order for it to stand, it has to be based on the original covenant that, that is, is, has been set from the beginning of time. And so I'm going to... Um, hmm. Thank you, Father. When we look at the, the covenant, when we look at the blood covenant, in order for us to understand that and, and to walk in it, we have, to, we have to begin to be in that place where Abraham was when God met him, when God made covenant with him. We have to journey into that place. We have to become a part of this word. Because sometimes when we, we read the word, and, and I know that in, in Christendom we, we have a tendency to do this sometimes. We go through the word and we go through it rather quickly. And we do not take time and allow that word to saturate our being and that we can, we can draw from the word that which, which the Spirit of God is, is saying unto us. But the Lord wants us, as, not just as a people, but as the church, as his sons in the earth, to understand that which he has given unto us. He has made covenant and he has placed it in the earth for us to be able to walk in that, to understand that. But most of all, that we would relate to the Father. We have to relate to him through covenant. If we're not relating through God, to God through covenant, then we're not relating to him at all. As a very young Christian, I wasn't even a year old at that time. And I remember I was, I had a great desire for the word and I just kept reading the word and just eating up the word and I remember coming to a passage in scripture and I didn't fully understand it and understand it and I read it a few times and I I didn't understand it and I picked up the phone I was going to call my pastor then to ask him about it and just as I the phone rang the phone actually rang and I I didn't get him and I didn't leave a message and as I hung up the phone the spirit of the Lord said to me he said if you understand covenant, you will understand faith. If you understand covenant, you will understand faith. And that is a seed that the Lord planted in my spirit when I was under a year old in the Lord. And I began to understand the, the meaning of the word covenant and how we as a people, how we as a church relate to covenant relationship with the Lord. How we as a people relate to each other in covenant relationship. Because we cannot extinct ourselves from our relationship with one another while we distinct ourselves in our relationship with the Lord. The two has to be intertwined to such a degree that we relate one to the other. If you are going to relate to me as a Christian, you must relate to me as a son of God in covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. Because I remember when I was in school and we did uh, uh, 
multiplication in a certain, a certain long multiplication. We had to find that common denominator in order to be able to get the job done. And as the children of God, as sons of God, there is something that link us together. It's the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. That is what link us together one person to the other. That is what link us together to God the Father. That is what link us together through Jesus Christ. And if we are not joined by the Spirit, if we are not joined in covenant relationship, then we are not joined at all. We are not joined at all unless we are joined in covenant relationship because it is the blood of Jesus that ties that cord that bond us together one to the other. It is the blood of Jesus that will cause us to lay our lives down one for the other because it was that blood, it's, it's his blood that was laid down and poured out that we may have life and have it more abundantly. When, when God came, first of all, Again, prophet made mention of Noah, how God made covenant with Noah. God made covenant with Moses. God made covenant with, with Abraham. And each time that God made a covenant, he would say to these individuals, when he made covenant with Noah, you'd see that in Genesis, the ninth chapter, God said, behold, I am establishing my covenant this binding agreement, this solemn agreement, I am establishing it with you and your descendants after you. And then, and that, that's in Genesis chapter 9, verse 9, and then in verse 11, he said, I will establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by water of a flood. And God set his covenant in the earth. And you can take time and read the word and meditate upon that. And he went on to say, I set my covenant in the clouds. And it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall be a sign. So whenever God made a covenant, there is always a tangible, there is always something tangible to hold that covenant together. When he said covenant with Moses, he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. He said, this is my covenant with you. And he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. When God made covenant with Abraham, we see that in Genesis chapter 15. We see it in 17. God said to Moses, and you shall, Abraham rather, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh. And it shall be a sign, a symbol, a memorial of the covenant between me and you. So each time God made a covenant, there is a tangible evidence of that covenant with God. And then as we make our way into the New Testament, we see Jesus. We see Jesus, the one who has sealed the covenant from the beginning through to the end and we are weaved into that covenant and the word tells us the word tells us that God gave his his son Jesus Christ that we whomever believe on him would not perish but have that everlasting life. I want to ask you today, what is your covenant relationship with God? What is that covenant relationship that you have with God the Father? How is that covenant sealed in God? What is the tangible evidence that you have that you are in covenant relationship with God the Father? 
Is it in your heart? Is that sealed in your heart that we can say today that God has placed his seal upon us and we know that we are his offspring because of the blood of Jesus? In Psalm 89, God was speaking concerning David. And he said in verse 33, he said, Nevertheless, I will not break off my loving kindness from him, referring to David, nor will I allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie unto David. And, this, and the scripture continue on through verse 37. But the point I want to bring out is that God's covenant is forever. It's forever established. And once he has spoken it, it is set in the earth. He said in Hebrews chapter 6 that when God made his promise to Abraham, he swore by an oath. Because he could swear by no greater. He, said, he swore by himself saying, in blessing, I will bless you, and in multiplying, I will multiply you. Whenever there is a covenant set, there is the greater and the lesser in the party. God is the greater, and we are the lesser part. But it takes the two parts to function effectively, to bring forth the fullness of the covenant if both parties are of the same strength, then one have no need of the other. Mm. If both parties are strong, then we have no need of each other. If both parties are weak, then we have no need of the other. And so we must keep that in mind in our covenant relationship even as we walk together in the earth. And the word cautions us that we do not compare ourselves among ourselves. Because they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. Because each member has a different function that they carry out. Each member has, each member of the body has a different, uh, okay, function that they're going to do, operation. And so as we work together, this is why the word, tell us, word tells us that if the whole body were an eye, then the body would be malformed. We would have this big eye. We would have an extremely big eye, you know, just going around. And there would be no hands to do anything. There would be no feet to take you anywhere. So each part of the body has a specific function. And as we come together as the body of Christ, we are able to carry out that which the Lord has purpose for us to do. There are diversities of operations in the body of Christ. There are strengths, there are weaknesses. And this is what together as a, as a body of Christ, the covenant relationship that we have through Jesus Christ, all of us coming under his covering because he is the fullness of the Godhead and the perfect one who can function. He doesn't, he, he doesn't, need us to be able to fulfill his function in the earth. He has graciously engrafted us in. 
he has graciously engrafted us in. And so we as the body of Christ, we want to be able to respond to the Lord and to minister to him in whatever capacity he has called upon us to do so. So at, at this point, So at this point, I'm, I'm just going to admonish us as the church, as the saints of God, as those who are called by the Spirit of God, as those who have received the adoption of sons. One of the things that the Spirit of the Lord uh, was stirring in my heart as I was preparing and going through the scriptures, he drew my attention to Proverbs, and I think that's in the third chapter, if I might just go back there. I want to draw your attention to this just before I close off here. Okay. In Proverbs chapter 3, the word began to... to I was quickened in my heart regarding how covenant is built on trust. We have to totally rely on and trust in the Lord in order to walk through this word. It's not something that we can do naturally. The Bible tells us that the natural man does not understand and he does not receive the things of God, and he cannot receive them. It's by the Spirit that we receive from the Lord. It's by the Spirit that we receive the impartation, the unctioning of the Holy Ghost that enables us to fulfill that which the Lord is calling us to do. It's by the Spirit that he lead us and he direct us. And so in order, if we are going to, as sons of God, operate in the earth and fulfill the manifested purpose of God, if we are going to, to come into that agreement, if we're going to come into the agreement and walk and reproduce the sonship that God is calling us to walk in, then we're going to have to trust him totally, rely on the Lord totally, and lean upon the Lord. Um, Hamilton, can I ask you and your wife to come? Come here, please, both of you. Stand there. Rebecca, stand apart just a moment. Okay. Now, one of the things that the, the Lord began to show me regarding trust is trust is the ability to lean on, to rely on, to throw our weight on, knowing that we will be fully sustained. That's what covenant relationship is. That's what the Lord began to demonstrate to me in, in that relationship with him. So lean on your husband. Show me your covenant relationship as you lean. Just, you just throw your weight on him. No, you cannot fall. <laughs> okay. You're just throwing your weight on him because you are confident. You are confident that he will sustain you. You are confident that he will bear you up. 
in any situation, in any given circumstance. You are confident that he's not going to fail you. That's what that trust, that confidence, that covenant relationship is all about. That's the covenant we have with, with the Lord. When we lean back on him, regardless of the situation, we're just leaning back on the Lord. We're just throwing our weight on him, knowing that he's going to sustain us. It doesn't matter what it may look like. He's there. He's going to sustain us. All the way through scripture, we can see that when Abraham, even before we got to Abraham, when Rahab didn't even fully understand what was there, she knew she had to hide the spies. She knew she had to protect them. She didn't know where her covering would come from. She didn't know where the protection would come from, but she had to do something. And because she stepped forth in that step of faith, not even knowing that it was faith, just knowing that something she had to do, then God protected her. God protected her. And when Abraham stepped out, God said to him, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Even when you don't understand it, Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And that's, that's what we receive from the Lord in our covenant relationship with him. In every situation, in every circumstance, he is our shield and our exceeding great reward. Amen? Amen. Amen.